Fireside Chat, Episode 5, recorded February 19th, 2013. Dreams of Dragger. Are you ready? See you, Red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat, featuring Dan, Matt, and Lucas. That's right, we're back. Matt, Lucas, how are you guys doing this week? Very good. I'm awesome. I'm actually just uh, thinking after hearing our rockin' new intro. Um, I've always wanted to be the guy on a TV show's opening credits who's at the very end and has end. And I always felt like that guy carried a certain... His character was more significant somehow. And uh, I think it's very cool that I ended up being the and at the end of this podcast. So you're Ann Lucas from here on in. I am. Oh, maybe that should be my new Twitter handle. Ann Lucas? Yes, I've lost three followers, by the way. You're that boring. Yeah, I don't tweet enough. This is my problem. Yeah, I I think I've sent three tweets out thus far, so, yeah. (laughs) Well, I use Twitter for work. I don't know how many came from the show, but I've gained six Twitter followers this week. Oh, wow. Well, but that's about an average week for me. So, the people have spoken. I guess so. I don't know if there are people or not, but well, Dan's just Mister Popular. So, well, guys, it's the uh, it's the nineteenth today as we record this, and it's been a heck of a week for Flames fans. We've had a couple big wins and big losses, and um, I think the big interesting story from the week is the fact that in the last four games, the Flames have gone through three goaltenders. We've had Leland Irving, Joey McDonald. And Danny Taylor all get a start for this team. Well, it's interesting that uh, with Danny Taylor starting, it's the first British import goalie since Byron Defoe. I didn't know that. Wow, that that's actually I I'm, I'm so much happier knowing he's actually British because it always seemed weird a guy from Boston or playing in Boston named Byron Defoe, just random American. No, he's a he's a Brit. I like that. Danny Taylor, by the way, uh, looked like a dehydrated Carey Price last night. In what really way? Weird. He just he, he, his, a lot of his mannerisms and play in net reminded me of Price, his positioning, etc. Except he was really like he just he looked tiny. Interesting analogy. Before we talk about the three goalies, how would you guys say the team's done now without Kipper? Have they managed to at least stay afloat? It could be better, but. You know, the, with the goalies that we've had and that, they're, they're, you know, the best that you can get is what they've gotten, so. They haven't embarrassed themselves, which is what I think a lot of people outside of Calgary thought would happen when Kiprasov went down, but it's still been, you know, fair to middle it at best, and that's that's probably being generous to it. Yeah, yeah. Speak yeah. Well, themselves. the right. three goalies, they're all fringe NHL or AHL goalies, so to expect an all-world caliber from them is very unrealistic. No, I I agree, and in that sense, just them not embarrassing themselves, even if they can't get wins, uh, you know, or at least not consistently, um, good good for them. They're they're trying as hard as they can, I'm sure. Lucas, I I like what you said about not embarrassing themselves. I know when Kipper went down, that's the first thing I thought is, oh crap, this is going to be a disaster. And I think that management has, um, we've talked in the past on the show about how we really like Jay Feaster and his management team. And I think they've made some good moves here. I mean, I think Irving was ready. It was his time to see if this guy was going to be the backup or not and what he had to offer the team. And he lost that job. And I think that's something that nobody was expecting. I know I wasn't. As soon as I saw Irving sent down to the farm, I was shocked. Like this, how could he lose this job? And I think that Joey McDonald coming in, he is a fringe NHL guy. He's got like a hundred games, but he's not again, not a you know, a backup with who brings confidence and maturity to this team. So I think that he's done well. I mean he's coming off an eleven month injury. He's done well in his one start and he looked like an NHL guy. But Danny Taylor sticking around with this team over Irving, that's what really surprised me. Well, I think it's uh, pretty clear that the organization doesn't feel that 
Leland Irving's got the mental uh, makeup to uh, be a starter or, or a contributor in the NHL right now. Uh, if you think about it, um, he was in position a lot of the time. Uh, he got pieces of pucks, uh, but he was very, like, they were all things that uh, scream non-confident goaltender. And, I mean, this was as gift-wrapped an opportunity as Leland Durden was ever going to get. I mean, if you can't hold off Joey McDonald, then you're not an NHL, you're, you're barely a backup. Like, or, or you're just not ready for this stage. And if Taylor sticks around, then even though he let in four goals last night, I thought there was a lot of good. Um, that's going to be the second time in two years that Danny Taylor has stolen Leland Irving's job and gotten him, gotten him demoted to another league. Yeah, I don't think we can blame that game last night, the Coyotes game on Taylor. No, and your entire team doesn't show up for the third period. <laughs> it wouldn't really matter who's in that for that. Uh, with... The goaltending situation, like, I think Irving's now done in the Flames organization. I don't see them holding on to him at all, because, you know, that was as gift-wrapped an opportunity, and he squandered it entirely, and, you know, you gotta just move on. It's not worth having the contract given to him for next year. And just get somebody else and see. Because, like, there's lots of uh, goalies from Europe that are doing well. Like, if you look at uh, how the Ducks signed Victor Fath, and he's come in and stolen the job from Hiller. You know, like, there's a couple other guys out there, like Red O'Bara and a few others that, you know, if you're in the need of a competent goalie, there are some out there. I think what, you know, and a credit to management again, perhaps, perhaps just because it was easy, but all of these goalies are on one-year deals. So, I mean, Ir- Irving is, after this year, he's gone. McDonald, after this year, he's gone. And Taylor, after this year, he's gone. So it really doesn't keep us on the hook for any one guy where we feel like we have to keep Taylor around because he's signed long-term. So good for um, Feaster and his team for putting themselves in a position where they do have options, like Matt said. They can re-sign any of these guys if they're good. They can go out and find somebody totally new, but it gives us all the freedom in the world at the end of the year. The only goalie we have who has a multi-year deal is Kipper. I really feel like out of every goalie we've got right now, um, I'd say the, I guess the one with the highest chance of success in this league is Really, Danny Taylor, but not because of anything physically that he does, but just because of the way he's battled throughout his career. And he's come up through the lower levels, and just he's not, like he's not even a prospect. He's an AHL contracted player. And you hear, like, this is how just you, you seem to discover goaltenders. You just, there's some guy who just wants it more than, than everyone else, and somehow against all odds seizes a job and i think you know i'd like to believe that that could be taylor i think you're right taylor probably has the best uh chance of success ahead of him he's also the younger of the two between mcdonald and taylor uh mcdonald's 33 and taylor's 26 but that poses a question for me and i want to know what both of you guys think if danny taylor's the guy who, who potentially has the most success ahead of him do we try to flip taylor when kipper's ready to try and get the better return or do we keep Taylor as the backup and get rid of Joey McDonald? Uh, get rid of Joey McDonald. Uh, Taylor has looked very solid in net thus far, and in the one game, and you need someone that's positionally sound and looks competent in what they're doing. And he looked more so that than McDonald did, and. Realistically, McDonald's not going to get claimed on waivers unless somebody else has a bad injury situation like we did. So you can likely just stick him in Abbotsford for a bit. And, you know, if the need comes, you can call him back up again. Uh, I don't see any way that uh, you don't keep Taylor, especially if you don't know what your goaltending situation is going to be like going forward, if you're going to trade Kiprasov or whatever. The only reason I was wondering that is when they first signed uh, Joey or first claimed Joey McDonald, 
Jay Feaster ended up saying that that was a guy that the team had identified as somebody that they would trade for. They're really high on Joey McDonald. So it makes me wonder if this organization is going to give him perhaps a a better shake than he's entitled to because they've been high on him for a while. Well, he was a goalie in uh, Boston when uh, Wisebrod was there. So, like, there's some familiarity with knowing, like, what he actually contributes, whereas Taylor's a giant question mark. But, you know, like, the, the results are what, will determine who's going to be where. And, like, if Taylor shows that he's clearly an NHL goalie that's superior, then I don't see them just giving him away. Danny Taylor, more than any goalie outside of Kiprasov that we've had, uh, had a sense of calm about him in the net with his performance that uh, makes me think that once he's up to speed with NHL shots, uh, he's he's got a much higher upside than anyone else that we've put between the pipes. I mean, you think about it, like, he he looked at times last night like he wasn't quite sure how fast and how hard those shots were coming in. But if he's able to figure that out quickly, uh, I mean, his toolbox is there. And we're we're judging both these guys, too, on one game as a flame, which isn't entirely all that fair, but it's based on our first impressions. Sports is about being reactionary. Realistically, Kipper's going to be back within a week and a half, so there's not really much time more to evaluate either of these guys. So it's pretty much left up to them to see who does what with it. Who proves that they should get the backup job. Well, I mean, and you say Kipper's a week to ten days away, but who knows? He could have a setback. They could be... Under uh, underselling the severity of his injury, I mean, it's, it wouldn't be the first time oh, yeah. it happened in pro sports. I mean, oh yeah, well, like, even if he's out for even if he's out for another two weeks, like there's still only so many games left between now and then to evaluate these guys. So yeah, like the first impressions, you pretty much have to run with that, and until things change. No, I'd agree with that. Yeah, and you know, I think that's part of the nature of being a backup goaltender. Is you don't have a large body of work every year for your team to evaluate. So you have to make every start, and not just every start, every minute in net, important because that is what you are evaluated on. It's not like Kipper where you've got a 70-game season. Some of these guys are lucky to get 5, 10 games in. Mm-hmm. Which is why I think we should create, like, for, for someone should find a way to develop like like a like a, a practice like a stat in practice that measures backup goalie performance and finds a way to turn practice numbers into like an equivalent regular game uh, number. Like if if you say seventy two percent of shots in practice or something, then that actually equates to uh, like an eight ninety save percentage and you know something like that, so that you can actually you know, in a way sort of tangibly measure. Uh, a backup goalie's performance, or at least do something that could possibly build his confidence up and make him think that when he does get his chance, he's going to be that much more legitimate. Sounds like a good weekend project for you, Lucas. I don't know the numbers. Thing, the only problem with that is that I've seen some goalies that are absolutely dreadful in things like the pregame skate, and then they'll come out and like get a shutout that night, and it's like, what? <laughs> you know... Like that, I know. I know you're saying like in no, no, practice I, and that, but it, it's hard. To, it's not the same thing. It's not. But I just I understand, and I understand that completely. Like always, all the time, you know, who are horrible or just don't care in practice and come out and pitch great games. But when you're a backup goalie, you just you need something to get yourself emotionally into, and. I think, you know, if you manage to create an atmosphere in practice where the backup was just like, all right, this is my, there is something at stake here, tangible that I can measure and that the coaching staff is going to acknowledge. And I don't know, I think that maybe prepares you better for when you actually do start. Because in as much as you're not getting game shots or game action, mentally, you are preparing for every practice like it's a game. Yeah, that also requires that all the shooters are shooting at you the way they would in a game, and I think that would be a lot harder to measure because it would require a lot of other people to be doing their job as well. Because if you mentally 
prepare yourself that way. Like in a certain way, it doesn't matter that nobody else is, if the, the other people aren't necessarily giving their all because you are mentally so focused on everything they're doing, even if it's not quite as accurate as it would be in a game, you are at a point where you're just so focused on it that it it's just, it's reps. And, it, and it's practicing a successful, you know, way of thinking and a successful behavior. But to get to success, you're saying you need a measurement. And I'm saying that I think it's tough to measure it unless everyone's doing their part. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't ever be exact, but it gives you something to to use or, or, or like some sort of baseline. And then... And for all we know, maybe Mallard Shuck has I know, something. That, that, they might. I, I mean, I've never heard it talked about. That doesn't mean they don't have it. But I don't know. Just an interesting idea. It is. It's kind of an interesting idea. It would take, like you said, a lot of work to figure something out. But it's it's not a bad idea. I've never thought yeah, of it. I mean, it I'm sure it would be some sort of, you know, year-plus-long endeavor just pouring over goalie film and doing... I don't know, examining the well, difficulty like of shots the and practice uh, thing I know that goalies uh, do when they're in net uh, is to give themselves points for how they control the puck on shots. Like if you save and stop the puck, it's a one. If you direct it to the corner, it's a two, that kind of thing. And the lower your point total, the better you did. So, you know, maybe something along those lines. Who knows? Mm-hmm. I mean, it couldn't hurt. I mean, our backups have been, you know, such a well-known issue. It's like our backups and our center depth is what we're what most known for. Through. And the fact that we can't score, even though we're actually pretty decent at that. Oh yeah, we could break the uh, we could break an '80s Oilers team's goal total, and we're like, ah, Flames. They need like they need more goal scoring. Can't score. Rock solid the defense. Worst goals <laughs> I don't know. With, with with Ryan Wilson playing 30 minutes a night. I don't know why I said Ryan Wilson, but, you know, whatever. We'd have some scrub as as, if, as our number one team <laughs> breaking one of their gold records. No. <laughs> we couldn't afford anybody else. It's like, we're going to win at most games 8-6. Well, that's pretty much what we're doing anyway <laughs> right now. I don't know if we're winning most games 8-6. We're having a lot of high-scoring games, but we're not always on the right side of those. Well, one stat that I thought was rather troubling from watching that Phoenix game last night is that the Flames have only held the opposition to under three goals twice this year. Like, that's ridiculous. That is. Yeah, it's it's really... It's almost football-like in the way that you just... when Like, you're watching, say... Um, if, if you're watching the Saints play, you're like... Oh, they're gonna just the other team's just gonna go down and score, and then Breeze is gonna have to step up, lead another touchdown drive, and be perfect if they want to have a chance to win. And the Flames, you're just like, okay, you're down one nothing. You can come back, but you're gonna have to come back and then some because you don't really seem like the kind of people who are up for holding this lead. The other stat that was troubling too is uh, that. Only the Panthers have given up more goals per game than the Flames, which goes to the same idea that, you know, these guys have to score and they've got to keep the puck out of their net or they're not going to win. And we're seeing so many games, like even the game last week that we won 7-4. to four. It feels awesome to get seven goals, but at the same time, we should not be letting four goals in in the same it's game. A bit, it, you're right. I mean, four goals against is... You know, it's not acceptable in, in this league at this stage of its evolution. But, I mean, you think about it, Florida, the only team that, that's given, that have given up more goals are the Florida Panthers. And I don't know if this is connected in any way, but they're also probably the only team in the league with less top-line forward, true forward talent on the top line than the Flames. Like, the top line of Versteeg, Weiss, and Fleischmann. We were all, you know, nice players, but first liners. No, those guys are definitely second yeah. line at best, all of them. And like, yeah, well, it's, it's a good time for me to be both a Flames and Panthers fan because I was both about to say, let's ask the really Panthers bad. fan in the room. <laughs> oh man, they're, they're just a mess. That everybody sucks on the Panthers. You, you're, in a, you're in a great <laughs> position. Bad. No matter who who you root for, you've got like an equally great chance of landing Nathan McKinnon. True, but you know, 
I'd like to actually see a team win a game once in a while. <laughs> oh, yeah, but that's just, you know, that, that, that makes it worthwhile. But, you know, they're trying. Win a game, play some postseason hockey. Those are all nice things, aren't they, Matt? Here's the, here's the thing. It, a, a slow start is 0-3. Uh, when you're 13th in the Western Conference, a third of the way through the season, you know, at, at what point? Yeah. At what point do we realize, okay, they can improve, but they aren't going to improve that much? No. Like, they're already four points out of eighth place, and really, if you're shooting for eighth place, that's not <laughs> a good place yeah, to that's be not, in. That's not a star you no. want to aim for. I mean, it's still very doable, but this team's really going to have to um, work hard to do it. Well, one thing I noticed after last night's game and Hartley's post-game press conference is that he seemed to be calling out Aginla's line, uh, saying that uh, he can't have players just randomly taking days off. And, you know, considering the other three lines all played somewhat decent, not great, but, you know, they were there at least. But the first line wasn't. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it doesn't take much to infer who he was talking about, but, uh, you know, like, at this point in the season, 13 games in, and Steve Bajan, Matt Stajan, and uh, Roman Horak all have the same amount of goals as Jerome Ginla. Like, there's something wrong with that. <laughs> hey, man, you win with guys like Steve Bajan. True, he did have the game winner in Dallas, so, yeah. <laughs> Am I the only one surprised he's still a flame? No. He's actually been rather decent in his fourth-line job. He's been better than Jackman, at least, so, you know, if you got somebody that's doing worse than you, you're, you know, you're still in the, the job, <laughs> at least. Because, I mean, we sat here on the first episode and said there's no way this guy makes it through camp. And he made it through camp, and he got a team, a uh, spot on this team, and he hasn't been too bad ever since. Yeah. For a 34-year-old who hasn't played in a couple of years? Well, he's been adequate, which, as a fourth liner, that's all you can really ask. Just don't embarrass yourself like the backups. You know, just go out and do something. Now you think at this point on this team, that's what it comes down to, is go do something productive. Yeah, well, the problem is is that the top-end players on the Flames, they tend to be doing a good job, but the low-end players, they're all struggling, and that's where I'm thinking that a lot of the problems with giving up so many goals is coming from. Because when you're having two lines of guys that are fringe NHLers at best, and your third defense pairing is a mess, and you're playing backups all the time, you know, like, that hurts. So if you can get somebody that's doing okay, (laughs) then, you know, that's better than guys like Como, for example, that have been, you know... Dreadful, <laughs> really. Were you dreadful. guys shocked when Hartley decided to put Como on Iggy's line as a centerman? I'm completely mystified. <laughs> I looked at that and I read that article, the game day article on the Flame site, like three times. I said, "What? Am I reading this correctly?" I refreshed the page. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, we're, we're vast. We're rapidly approaching the point in the season where everyone's just out of answers. Um. And it occurs to me, like, with Maddie saying the bottom th- two lines are made up of fringe NHLers, as is the third defense pairing, um, that's a function of some absolutely terrible cap management. I mean, I, I really think that this team could do with being a good $20 million, Not, I don't know if that's even possible, uh, say a good... $12 million under the salary cap for a year just so they can get guys who are a little bit hungrier, maybe a little bit less complacent uh, to just come in and buy in and, and you know, I don't know, tr- try something different. Because I, I don't know that there's a, a less, uh, outside of Columbus, a consistently less bang-for-buck cap team than the Flames. Well, like if you look at, uh, to illustrate your point, 
you got Stage and Sarich, Babchuk, and Como making $9 million, and all of them, if they weren't in the NHL, you wouldn't really notice. And Stajan has been the best of that bunch, but he's still not anything to write home about. No, he's an average third-line center in the NHL. Yeah. Yeah, like just, Doesn't get paid like one. No, and then you add Camilleri and Aginla, who have been absolutely terrible for large stretches of games. Like, Cam, Camilleri's had goals in two games. Like, he has four goals, but those all came in two games. Like, you know, uh, that... You know, like, when a 30-year cap is tied up in those six players who are all significantly underperforming, like, that's just not acceptable. Well, I said, you can't have one of your top guys, your top six, or even your top three, getting all of his points in two games. Mm-hmm. And, just and, your other, and other parts of your top three just not getting points at all. Though, you know, I think the Flames really got a, a save this year, if you will, in that the uh, check line of Cervenka and Hoodler have been interesting to watch, and I think that's the the line the fans are the most interested in right now. And I really like Rowan Horak on with those guys. What do you guys think? Instant chemistry with those three. They've looked a lot better as a unit. I'd rather have Horak play here with those guys than play in the AHL right now. True. Yeah, um... Horak's a Horax, a really nice look, young player. Uh, Cervenka looks better every game. Uh, every game I watch, he's creating chances. He's involved in the play. He's around the puck. Uh, and even though he hasn't cashed as much in as we'd hope, um, you know, I, I think uh, he is on the of, of the current players on the roster. He's the one you look to extending. Yeah. In short order. Well, the thing is with Cervenka, he's struggled. He hasn't been up to speed and all that, but he's still at a producing at a, about a forty point pace over the course of a fully two game season, which you know that's actually fairly decent considering he's coming off an injury and adapting to a new league. Like that's pretty good, actually. Yeah, I've liked what I've seen from him so far, not just in his production ramping up but just his whole game i really like Mm -hmm. i i'm really interested to see him once he starts playing center i think you know he's probably the last guy in this team who hasn't played center yet yeah well actually i'm hoping that the flames can do something either during the offseason or before to address the lack of centers because Another part of why we're having such issues with giving up goals is that natural centers tend to be more defensively oriented as well as offensively oriented, and the wingers are more just, let's get goals. And when you're converting, like, say, Tange to center, he's not sure of exactly where to be in the defensive zone, and, you know... A skilled offensive team can see right through that and make plays around that, and it goes in your net. So, you know. This, this is why you can't build with wingers. Look at, look at, look at Boston. Krejci, Sagan, Bergeron. Like, who's that number one center? They've got three. The, and, the, you know, the Penguins or, or any the, of the good the, teams, the Blackhawks, any good team, just centers, centers. Like wingers are, wingers are like NFL running backs. They're you're you're absolutely replaceable. Jonathan Chichu has scored fifty goals in this league. All you have to do is be present. Yeah. If you're playing with a good center. Oh yeah, because they'll find you. But you know, like the centers tend to be more able to play a complete game. Which the for, the wingers tend to be just more. Let's rush the puck up and get some goals. And exactly, the the center is I'm have I'm gonna have to be the grown up around here and look after you two idiots because you're selfish and you don't know what you're doing. You have one job: you cover your point man, and you can't do that. Well, it's like a midfielder I, in soccer where they have to play on both sides of the field, and you know they're more responsible. It, yeah, you know, trying to convert a winger whose primary objective is let's get a goal is 
you know, unless they're a defensively responsible winger, like, it's just a mess. <laughs> When you're a defensively responsible winger, like when that's your calling card, like you, you really need to start learning to take face-offs because a defensively responsible winger is going to get waved if that's all you bring. Oh my god. Como, you mean? <laughs> no, he's a center now, don't you know? Oh. Top line, in fact. Oh yeah, I forgot, I see? forgot. <laughs> you wonder how many guys there... Putting at the center position just so that they can try to call other GMs and pass the guy off as a center now in some sort of a trade deal. Maybe, but you think about this. If you're a defensively responsible winger and that's what your role is, and that's, again, all you have to do is watch the point man and make sure that no one ever really gets, you know, outmanned. And you can't screw that up. It's like the simplest task that you would give to a child. Like, oh my god, figure it out. <laughs> I know, like, like unless have... you're defending Scott Niedemeyer or Nick Lidstrom, like, it, you know, that's about the only situation where a defensively responsible winger is actually useful. <laughs> exactly, it's like, if you, I would love to know what would happen if you just had two wingers and just said, look, play man-to-man -man against the defense, don't let them do anything. Like, don't interfere with them, but just cover them. Play play defensive back. I'm in a real football mood today. but Because <sighs> it would just be a three-on-three -three battle down low. That's all it would be. But no, because wingers are stupid and selfish. <laughs> Settle down there, Luke. That's the, that's the title of this week's episode. Wingers are stupid and selfish. <laughs> all right. Wingers are stupid and selfish. So, guys, I was just while you were talking, I was listening, and I was also looking through the uh, NHL unrestricted free agent list. Just curious as to if the Flames wanted to go a bit of a different direction, who's available and looking for work? And uh, some interesting names in there. Not necessarily the guys I would want to be a number one center, even guys that are capable of a center, but of being a number one center, but guys that are actually centermen. And the two names I'm seeing here that are interesting. One is. Um, a de the one guy that we know well here in Calgary is Damon Lankow still looking for a job. And the other one's Jason Arnett. What would you guys think if the Flames reached out to either of those guys? If I recall correctly, Lanko had to retire. So I'm not sure if he's available or not. And as for Arnett, if he's medically sound, that might not be a bad idea. We need Just, anybody. No. <laughs> yeah, I think last time Arnett tried to get a job, he couldn't pass the medical clearance. Yeah, he just failed a physical two weeks ago with the Rangers, and it's just like I know you. You do want to do whatever you can to be uh, a, a good NHL team, and if you know, I, I would much rather see them exhaust any and all farm call-up options before I. I like I don't know how you don't see Reinhardt here at least before you give Jason Arnett a shot. I mean, what's what's Jason Arnett going to do? Get us from 13th to 10th or 11th? Well, that's it. No, I totally agree with you. I just, you know, sometimes you always have to look at everything that's out there because a GM panics, GM goes to the UFA market. We've seen it happen before. Yeah, you have to leave every stone, you know, turn over every stone before... You sort of do, but how many times really do you ever... Hear any like see a signing like this, and does when is it ever like oh well that was a real signing that put them over the top, or is that just like uh, well that that's not gonna work? And of course, it if it's anything, it's a stopgap to keep you barely above water at the position. Actually, the one guy that I thought uh, was still unrestricted, I don't know if he had signed in the meantime, was Dominic Moore. That he might be a solid Glen Cross type. Center. Moore's still unsigned. Yeah, because I know it. Is he really? Yeah, because his wife passed away, unfortunately. Yeah. So he might just be taking the season off, but, you know. A guy that I'm surprised is still unsigned. He's not a centerman, but uh, Trent Hunter is still without work, and he's always a guy I've thought would fit in well here on a third line role. I, th I thought he couldn't skate. Yeah. And. In my, I, that, that's just a message board opinion I've gleaned. I've never, I can't say I've really watched him play, but when you can, when the Islanders no longer want your services, what does that say? Blake Como. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Well, okay. So, Trent Hunter. TJ Brody's going to need to give up number seven. For sure. Trent Hunter's coming to save the day. Yeah, he just got bought out uh, by L.A. Yeah, Los Angeles. Yeah. Ugh. But no, there's some there's some interesting names here that are still unsigned, and maybe it's because the GMs are all trying to get started so quickly. But some of these guys, I'm surprised, are still unsigned. Yeah. Dominic Moore, you know, this way, you sign him so you can pick up that second round pick at the deadline. I feel like though, especially I don't know if he had kids or anything, but I feel like he's probably waiting to, you know, towards more the deadline so he can pick a team that's not going to trade him and he can just go to the conference finals on his own terms you could be right i'm sure he'll play this year but he's not gonna play for us if he thinks a team can get to the third round he'll go to them yeah if that team's looking for for uh forwards at the at the deadline every playoff team's looking for dominic moore i think anyway even if he hasn't played for a while he's he's sort of a, a, a rabbit's foot in the playoffs all right what else we got Lucas, uh, before the show, you were mentioning a little bit about uh, Jerome McGinley. Do you want to talk about anything that's going on there? Any of the rumors surrounding Iggy? Oh, um, no, yeah, we didn't address this uh, last week. But, uh, I mean, I could have been dreaming when I saw this, but I don't believe I was. Um, Darren Drager on one of the TSN intermissions uh, reported that uh, th- there was some sort of uh, communication between Aginla and the Flames that said something to the effect of I-, I would be willing to put together a list if asked or something to that extent. So just the an indication that, you know, he would at a certain point be willing to waive that no-move clause that he brought up last year, week. So do you dream about Darren Drager a lot? Yeah, he has a little weird obsession about him. Yeah. He's very dreamy. You've seen that hair. I, you know, whatever you guys dream about, that's up to you. Uh, keep that to yourselves because well, whatever goes on with you, you and Drager. I know, but now I'm wishing I didn't because whatever goes on with you and Drager in your mind, especially Drager and his little Blackberry, it always annoys the hell out of me. Every time you see him, he's on his damn little Blackberry. He's a big fan of the QWERTY. Well, one uh, thing I did hear about is that at the Flames games last week, that like there was like 15 to 20 NHL scouts from across the league that were here to watch us, which, you know, you, you know, like if it say someone like Como or, you know, a minor player, you might get like one or two people interested, but you know, to get 20 people interested, you know, you, you're likely talking about a Ginla or Kipper or Bomeister or, you know, Someone that's actually worth trading for? You could be, but it could also be a recognition. Because the Flames have, have never really been this... Bad? Bad in terms of record. <laughs> uh, this could just be vultures circling the corpse, you know? True. Like Everyone's like, look, these guys are going to be out of it by March. So uh, go see what we can, if there's anything we'd want and, you know... Oh well, yeah. well the the flames do have quite a few good high end pieces, so like there definitely is things to scout when here it's just you know with twenty scouts you know like that's seeming to be something more significant than even like scouting Camillary or Tange or you know any of the decent second line guys but it, it, you're right. It is weird that all twenty. You, you wouldn't uh, expect, you know, all twenty guys to go dumpster diving on the same night. No. That 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 only happens when you know someone threw out a TV. Pretty much. <laughs> so if you're uh, if you're Jerome McGinley, you are willing to work with the team. Do you just pretty much tell them send me anywhere that's a contender, or who do you think he put specifically on that list? Do you think he wants another Canadian team? Do you think he'd rather go to the East or stay in the West? Honestly, I think that he would look at the teams that have the best overall makeup. Like, if you look at Chicago or Boston, like, they have good centers, they have good wingers, they have good defense. 
you know, they both have questionable goaltending, but, you know, with all the other pieces, they got enough where that's not essential. And, you know, like, if you look at teams like, say, Pittsburgh, they're not quite as depth deep in all those positions, so, you know, he might be more willing to go to a more complete team that stands a good chance at winning the Cup than a team that's good, but not, you know, quite built for the postseason. Yeah, I've thought for a while if Iggy was leaving, it's weird you mentioned Boston, because I've always thought if he ever left... I could see him playing in Boston. It just seems like a good fit for him. Yeah, well, with Ferentz being there, that seems like the most natural fit. But And especially, they do have quite a few good prospects, like Ryan Spooner. So, yeah, might be a decent fit. Yeah, I, I imagine his top four would probably have to be uh, Chicago, Pittsburgh, um, Chicago, Pittsburgh, Boston, and I don't know whoever else would be uh, at the top of the at the top of the heap when the, when the deadline arrives. But I think those are at least the top three. Probably the Rangers are on there. Um, maybe the Ducks. Well, maybe, yeah. That wouldn't that be great? Um, uh, I don't know. I, I think honestly the. the I don't think it really matters which conference he's traded to from an organizational standpoint. I don't think the Flames are worried about him coming back to burn them or anything. Uh, I, I just you know you just know he's not being traded within the Northwest. Yeah. And really, I don't think any of the teams in the Northwest would have what we're looking for anyway. So I agree. Yeah, I'm, I I think you're all right. He's not going to go anywhere in the Northwest, um, but. I don't know. He's. I mean, he is slowing down, and that's the thing. And uh, you, you, we could sit here all night and debate if he's more of a Western player or an Eastern player. But yeah, I've seen for a couple of years. I've always thought, you know what? If he's going to get traded, I could see him going to the Bruins. I think uh, Chirelli would be willing to trade for him. Mm-hmm. I and I think at his age as well, just playing on the East Coast, not having that constant travel wear on him, would only help him. Yeah, and especially with the way that uh, the NHL tried to reformat the league uh, with the conferences, the division that he would be playing in if he went to Boston would be ridiculously low travel. So, yeah, might be an option. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people say Pittsburgh's name when Jerome's brought up. But I just I don't know what they would have to give back. And as a Flames fan, first round pick and Derek Pouliot. Well, that's it. They'd have to start dipping into really high picks. I don't know if they. Yeah, but they're a team that wants to win a Stanley Cup. And ultimately, if you get that ring, which they are completely capable of doing, you know, sorry, Derek Pouliot was the cost. Like Brett Hull was the cost for our championship. Worth it. You think they do Pouliot? Uh, I, I think it would depend if, if on Easter, you have to it would you have to hold up for him. It would depend on like the secondary pieces. Like you might be like say like a, if you went with like Olimata a, a first and a second. If you went with Pouliot instead, you might only get the second and like another fringe player. It depends, but who knows? But I mean, I, I I would take that. I would just yeah. I mean, if honestly, if it was. Pouliot in a second or a first and a cap dump. Uh, I'm taking. I, I'd take the top ten pick last year, please. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really wouldn't complain about whatever we get for Ginla. Like as long as it's legit, not you know, like the FNUF return. Yeah. yeah, as long as it's legit, then anything's acceptable to me. So, Well, I think every deal that Feaster's done as a Flames GM so far, he's made good deals. Like He hasn't had any just crazy outlandish one-way deals. Where you look at it and go, wow, we really got hosed there. Like we saw from Daryl several times in the last year, year and a half he was here. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, keep in mind, Feaster's not a guy who's making trades to save his job. Um, 
True, and, and, and I think uh, that might also help his cause in getting something fair back. Mm-hmm. And you know, we we can only his trades. Some of his trades, anyway, still have a chance to get better if Ramo comes over and performs well, which you know you, you always hope for. Then that makes, in as much as the who won that Camilleri work trade kind of flip flops. I mean, I think the the tide swings a little bit back more in our favor. Yeah, I agree. All right, guys. Well, I think that's probably about it for the week, unless anyone else has anything they want to talk about. Uh, light week for the Flames in terms of games. Uh, they've got four. Well, I guess not that light, but a couple. They've got a two-day break um, on Thursday, Friday. They play again tomorrow night against the Kings, which brings Daryl Sutter back to town. They've got the Wild on Saturday, the Coyotes on Sunday, and then the Wild again on Tuesday. What do you guys think? What? How many points are we going to get out of in those four games? Two. I have no idea, but honestly, thank God Dave Tippett didn't come to coach this team. What a boring hockey club to watch. Oh, well, uh, that, there's no that way. game yesterday was one of the most boring games. Like Even the wild games from when Lemaire was coaching were more exciting than that. I agree. Uh, that that was painful. Oh, no wonder nobody shows up to watch you, Phoenix. Like you know, honestly, even if you won the cup, I think they'd have a hard time getting people out. That's how boring the games are. Well, I mean, at a certain point, like it's great to win, but people have to care that you're winning. Yeah. Or about what you're winning. If I'm a world champion dominoes player. Like how, is, does that impress either of you? Well, how would you say, like, if the, they were a Canadian team, that might be passable because, you know, Canadian fans are nuts, but, like, it, it, you're talking about a hockey team in a desert. Like, really, it needs to be more wide open and interesting, not, can I go to bed now? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, like, you think about it, they're just selling, like, oh, we're winning, but it's like... I don't, especially in Phoenix, like, help me understand why I should care, because none of this looks very fun. No. You're just kind of... Well, it's not representing hockey very well there. You know, like, it's so boring, the games, like, it's... You know. That was awesome. You're not representing hockey well. Oh, my. Gosh, that was fantastic. That reminds me of the time I broke up with a girl by telling her I don't see myself falling in love with you. Oh, wow, that was fantastic. Well, it's true. Like, that was so bad. Like, you know, it was actually painful. I wanted to not watch the game anymore after halfway through the second. Like, it was just that bad. Yeah, I tried to make uh, watching Danny Taylor's first start a storyline for me, but I just... God save me, couldn't. Also, how possible is it, how hard, how easy is it to really get excited about a team whose main color is burgundy? Oh, uh, actually, I don't really mind their third jerseys that they were wearing last night, but... No, they're fine, but your base color's still burgundy, and that doesn't fire anybody up. No. The only way it does is if you've got, you know, the rest of Iron Man's suit to go along with it. True. And even then, that's still more royal red. Yeah. It's just a little bit subdued. Like, ugh, <laughs> Phoenix. They should move to Quebec. <laughs> they should just move. At a certain point, just accept that your apartment sucks and move on with your life. Just because it's near a Cobbs doesn't mean you have to keep living there. Yeah, I think at this point, anywhere they move to will be better than where they're at. Of course. Even Kansas City. If you look, if you lived in Cabrini Green your whole life and then you moved to Forest Lawn, you'd think you'd move to Bel Air. <laughs> uh. You could be the fresh prince of Forest Lawn. <laughs> oh, that's uh, okay. I, I don't. You whistle for a cab, and when it came, and when it comes near, you might get shot at. So you better duck. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Is, I feel like you're far more likely to get stabbed in Forest Lawn. I don't think we're a handgun culture. 
So you're saying that the license plate read fresh and there was a knife in his hand? Yes, absolutely. That it was in my thigh. <laughs> Blood uh. was dripping down my leg and I was very scared. <laughs> you should write us a song for next week. You should write us the Fresh Prince of Forest Lawn song. I was thinking that music could have been my calling. Just the other night. Were you? I was. This was between sessions of Dreaming About Darren Drager? Yeah. Okay. As long as we know what to do with your time. Yeah. I well, guys, say- we're coming up on an hour, so should we say yep. goodbye? Certainly. I'll remind everybody before we do to check out firesidechat.ca. That's our website where you can get all the past episodes, you can get some great articles, and you can find out where to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Google+, uh, both personally and as a show. Oh yeah, um, yeah. I've decided to please don't follow me at Luke seventeen oh one because I'm mad at the internet and the people on it. Uh, so yeah, we good? Yep. I think so. All right. Anything else from you good guys? To go. No. Send s- send us home, Dan. All right. We'll see everybody next week. Suck it, Tom. <laughs>